I invite you to hear the word of God as it comes to us from Mark, chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. They came to Bethsaida, excuse me, Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his home, saying, Do not even go into the village. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And continuing on, chapter 8, starting with verse 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah, and he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my beloved. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. Well, did you read about the great archaeological discovery made recently in the Middle East? Researchers found a copy of the Galilee Commercial News from around the year 30. Even the employment section was intact including this brief help wanted ad. Disciples needed, must be willing to travel frequently, listen carefully, and follow directions. 
Individuals with at least a little faith are preferred. Good vision is a requirement as disciples must be able to see beyond present circumstances to what's really important. Seeking those who will take risks for employer, act boldly, confront fears regularly, stand up to intimidation, persevere under difficult circumstances, and submit to being transformed. The timid and unimaginative need not apply. Resume is not necessary. If I can use you, I'll call. An invitation up the mountain with Jesus must have seemed to Peter, James, and John a lot like winning the lottery. Special travel with their boss slash friend away from the other disciples, glimpses of the long dead Moses and prophet Elijah, and the transfiguration of Jesus from human to holy before their eyes. Up until this moment, in fact, the transfiguration is the most dramatic evidence given to them of Jesus' unique relationship with God. A mountaintop spiritual experience, if there ever was one. Frankly, Peter needed a few days with a good view and a brief hiatus from the constant stress and strain of discipleship. Don't get me wrong, Jesus was good to work for, despite the demanding schedule and the puzzling parable talk, but there weren't a lot of perks to the job. Peter was tired of being hounded by the chief priests and scribes who were constantly criticizing and picking fights with Jesus and the disciples. Peter's own learning curve had been pretty steep and he had absorbed just about all the holy talk he could handle. Recently, he had become deeply disappointed and confused by the twists and the turns that Jesus' teachings had taken. The hopeful Messiah message had morphed into Jesus' declarations about crucifixion and resurrection. So in Peter's mind, this change of scenery up the mountain would just get Jesus' mind off the whole suffering savior thing. Well, I imagine it was more than just altitude that messed with Peter's brain up there on the mountain. His experience was a disciple's dream come true, the moment that every follower of Jesus then and now longs for, a face-to-face encounter with God one-on-one time with the master when the blinders are torn away and the glory of the Lord is visible and clear and up close. The chance to truly and unmistakably hear the voice of God, the rare occasion to glimpse both heaven and earth. And to top it all off, what a thrill it was being specially chosen by Jesus for the trip. Peter's already healthy ego swelled to twice its normal size as he imagined what this journey might mean for his future, like second in command, vice savior, a new religion named after him, or maybe a holiday. And who can blame Peter for wanting to prolong the joy? He had such a great time that he wanted to build a couple of houses so they could all stay on the mountain and live happily ever after. And then Jesus said, dude, this isn't what we're here for. We have to go to the cross. The problem with dazzling mountaintop experiences, spiritual or otherwise, is that they end. Whether the climb is to the peak of holy enlightenment or understanding or joy or success or professional accomplishment. And the reason is that an encounter with the holy, a meeting with God in a high place, isn't just for the sake of encountering God and finding affirmation 
of your own specialness in God's eyes. An encounter with God is also about what we are empowered to do next because of the experience. An Olympic athlete spends years training for a few seconds or maybe a couple of minutes of competition and then enjoys a couple of moments of glory, receiving a medal maybe or getting her face on a cereal box and then it's down from the award platform and back to four more years of grueling physical and mental preparation. A student goes to class and does homework and studies for tests and every once in a while his or her achievement is recognized with an A or a, a place on the honor roll or a scholarship, but then it's back to the books for more hard work. The couple fall head over heels in love, can't eat or sleep for thinking of the other, declare love, make promises, get married, and then they live, sometimes well, sometimes not, through financial stress and child stress and job stress and sickness and health and the monotony of daily life. But in the years to come, there is that occasional glance of longing across the room, the flutter in the stomach when he walks through the door, the squeeze of her hand, the assurance that the choice to make a life together was the best decision ever, even though it's been really hard. And Christians, we plug along in life, worship, pray, give thanks, study the Bible, endure pain and loss, wonder sometimes if God is even there. And then every once in a while we have that moment when it's clear, we get an answer to prayer, we experience a cosmic coincidence, we feel the presence of God. And then it's back to the daily task of being faithful. You might recall other intense mountaintop encounters with God in the scriptures. It was at Mount Horeb that Moses stumbled across the burning bush, heard God declare the spot holy ground and then was outfitted with a pocket full of miracles and commissioned for his work as the leader of the Israelites, a ragtag bunch who hardly ever listened or obeyed. And years later, the air was thin at Mount Sinai when God delivered the substance of the covenant to the people through Moses, including the Ten Commandments. Following each life-changing encounter up there, Moses had to make his way down to face the whining, sniveling, complaining, challenging, sometimes suffering, and always difficult mass of humanity. How much more fun his job would have been if he could have just stayed up on the mountain with God, and maybe used a messenger service or something to deal with the Israelites. And Elijah, who grew so discouraged in his ministry that he asked God to end his life, heard the powerful voice and counsel of the divine on that mountain, which enabled him to go back down and continue his work even though the Israelites ignored almost everything he said. As Moses and Elijah knew and Peter was soon to learn, a disciple's primary job is not to live on the mountain in a constant state of wonder and ecstasy surrounded by dazzling displays of God's presence, but to live mostly down below, finding strength and sustenance for the journey in those occasional glimpses of holiness experienced up high. Because the journey often necessitates traveling through the cloudy ambiguity of life with plenty of side trips to the valley of the shadow of death, the disciple receives with gratitude those moments, those mountaintop moments as gift and grace soaking up the light from God for courage and wisdom for the struggles ahead. As much as they might like to stay there, disciples always go down from the mountain for whatever comes next. For a lot of us, church functions as kind of a mountaintop, a place of rest and grace apart from the daily stresses we all confront 
Surely we have heard people say, or we've said ourselves, I feel better just for having gone to church. Gives me a good feeling for the rest of the week. To be honest, I don't think God calls us to be here for the good feelings that we get. Because just like a mountain is a place you come down from, the church is a place you go out from. Our being in the church today serves God's purpose if we leave here, not simply feeling better about ourselves, but rather being better equipped to be the church in the world, to meet and greet the whining, complaining, sniveling, challenging, sometimes suffering and always difficult mass of humanity we will surely encounter as soon as the church doors shut behind us. As the holy season of Lent begins on Wednesday, it is time for us to come down from God's dazzling presence on the mountain to follow Jesus. Not in his moments of greatest glory, but through the valleys of temptation and doubt and fear and make our way through the clouds of abandonment and uncertainty and loneliness and then directly through the valley of suffering and death. We go not with the promise of an easy passage, but with the assurance that occasional moments on the mountain will sustain us for a time. We can't stay up there forever. Jesus didn't. A mountain is a place we come down from. A church is a place we go out from into the world and all its darkness. And then we reflect the dazzling light of God that we saw in here and experienced up there. Amen. <laughs>